when we approach all of that from this perspective of, I need to do these things to get better, to be a more acceptable human so that I can be more worthy and then I'll be happier. It doesn't work that way. Those things are not designed to make you more worthy. They are designed to make your quality of life better. So we have to start from a foundation of worthiness. We have to start from neutralizing all of these things. These things are all morally neutral. You're not a better person if you can meal prep. They're just functional things. And the only reason to engage in them is because they make your life better. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, hi, Nikki. Hi, Pete. How are you? Are you feeling good? I am feeling good. How about you? I'm relieved. We have a new website. We do. We have a new website, takecontroladhd.com. Same URL. It's still still takecontroladhd.com. Just a different look. Yeah. Lots of things have moved around. Uh, What has not changed is how you find the podcast episodes. I didn't update any of the um, uh, any of the URLs. Everything still should work the same way it has worked. It just (laughs) we say should because (laughs) it's it's, as of today, it's very new. Yes. uh, So uh, if if anything is broken and you know where to find me on Discord, please DM me and let me know if you find something that's all uh, mucked up. I kept I kept Melissa up way too late last night. You guys were awesome uh, doing link checking and clicking all the buttons and submitting all the forms and testing things. So um, I, I guess that is to say. Um, if it's still broken, uh, it means Melissa and I failed to see it. And so we appreciate, <laughs> we appreciate your uh, contributions there. You're the best. So new website, check it very out. fun. Uh, and much, much more new stuff coming now that we're on the new website. So stay tuned. Um, we are talking to Casey Davis today, influencer, TikTok, yes. big, big on TikTok. Are you getting closer to wanting to be on TikTok, Nikki? No. With these conversations? No. no, not yet. Okay. All right. No, because just she's doing such a great job. Yeah, she's doing it for us. We don't <laughs> yes. need to because she's she doing fine. She has a great message. And I do. I love her message. I love how she frames all this stuff. So it's, it's a great conversation. I think so, too. She's wonderful. Before we bring Casey out, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Oh, yeah, the new website. And get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there, as you always have been able to do so, or subscribe to the mailing list. Just scroll scroll down to the bottom of literally any page, and you can (laughs) add your name to the mailing list. We'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us. First and foremost, join that ADHD Discord community. Uh, It is wonderful. You can jump there anywhere you see the little Discord happy icon on the website. It'll take you to the invitation. You can join the free community. But if you really want to connect with us, you can uh, become a patron at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Your membership allows you access to all kinds of fun things that uh, the free community does not see. It's just like unveils, like walking through a, a platform nine and three quarters. And you see so many new, wonderful things when you do that. Uh, And so we hope that you uh, check that out. If you've ever, uh, if you've been listening to the show for a long time and you've you've wondered what these resources are, or if you just think, hey, you know what? I really like the ADHD podcast. I like what Nikki and Pete are doing and I want to support that. I want to support them continuing to be able to grow the show. Uh, Then uh, support us. A few bucks a month gets you access to all kinds of new things, including uh, Pete's new podcast, The Placeholder Podcast, which is available only to members of Patreon. Uh, you get coffee with Pete and coaching with Nikki at the supreme uh, platinum level, at the platinum level. Uh, and we have special bonuses at every level of uh, Patreon support. So we sure, surely, surely appreciate you there. Do we have any other news for the good people? No, not at this point. Excellent. Well, then it's time. Let's boot up the old TikTok and bring out Casey Davis. Casey? Casey? 
Casey Davis is a licensed professional therapist, author, and speaker, and is the big brain behind the mental health platform Struggle Care. Casey began her mental health journey at 16 when she entered treatment for drug addiction and mental health issues. And she got sober, and then she became a speaker and an advocate for mental health and recovery, and then an influencer on, you know, the internet. She's amazing. And quite recently, she introduced me to Hamper, the coolest laundry service I've ever seen with a level of enthusiasm that is unmatched for laundry. For all of the above and so much more, thank you, Casey, and welcome to the ADHD podcast. I am so glad to be here. Oh, my gosh. So where do we even begin, Pete? Let's talk about you. Uh, you are you're in Houston, right? I am. OK, in Houston. Husband's lawyer. Delightful. We don't really care about him right now. Uh, I am fascinated. We're doing this whole series on um, influences, influencers in the broader sort of mental health, ADHD, neurodiversity community. And um, you have a fantastic community yourself. And I'm so curious how you ended up putting yourself in a position where you are a voice to so many people. So I, I hope we... Uh, I hope we can kind of wind our way through that conversation today. Uh, and when you're asked how you ended up where you are, what do you say? Uh, I typically start by saying it was an accident. As as all great things are. Yeah, I never set out to be an influencer. I never set out to, you know, do any, I'd be an author, any of that. Um, I worked because I went to rehab when I was young. I worked the majority of my therapist career in addiction. And then I started to be a stay-at-home mom. And when I was, when I started being a stay-at-home mom, I started just doing family work. So I worked with families that um, had loved ones in drug rehab, doing boundary work, things like that. Um, and all along that, I've always been a messy person. I've always mm -hmm. like not really understood how people did like clean as you go. I've always been someone to have a mess and kind of a dirty house. And, you know, that has always, but it's always been like moderately functional, right? I guess mm -hmm. it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, and I think what was interesting was that when I was in my addiction, there were several things that people could point to that they would say, like, this is part of why you're like not functioning. Like, this is part of what we need to rehab about you. And part of that was like, I didn't take care of myself physically. So I like didn't shower very often. I didn't brush my teeth very often. Um, I never cleaned anything. I was failing out of school. I was late to everything. Um, and then I went to rehab and I was in rehab for like 18 months inpatient. Wow. And mm -hmm. we had these very strict schedules and, and, you know, you do chores, you chores every day. You're, you have to shower every day. So they like not only rehabbed all of these like things about my personality and mental health that like needed help, but they also like attempted to fix these other ancillary issues about like not caring for myself and, you know, being messy and not being responsible. And, um, and then some other delightful things about me, like how I interrupt everyone how I don't wait for people to finish their question before I start answering. And those things were pointed out to me as like, these are ways in which you're being selfish and self-centered. And like, oh, that's going to get in the way of you like recovering from your addiction. And like, this is a part of you being arrogant. Um, so then I get out of rehab and it in, in many ways was very helpful. I'm sober. I am in therapy. I am like, I don't have a ton of distress in my life anymore. Like my mental health symptoms have all mostly been resolved. Um, and from the first 24 hours of out of rehab, immediately it's like, and surprise, I'm still messy and don't shower every day. <laughs> right, right. Yep. That didn't get fixed. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it turns out that wasn't actually connected to the addiction. Right. Yeah. Um, certainly my ability to take care of myself was impacted, but turns out like I am just a messy person. Um, and I just am never going to want to shower every day and I'm never going to want to brush my hair every day. And, you know, I think the other thing that happened was recognizing, you know, here recently I got an ADHD diagnosis as an adult, looking back and realizing all of the things that sort of got put up as these like moral character failures yes. that I now am like, Oh no, I just had ADHD. 
Yes. Well, and that's what I mean by right. You're right. When I say, oh, it didn't get fixed. Right. Because of course it's not going to get fixed. It's not broken. It's just part of your ADHD. And that is something I definitely want us to hit on with, with your book that I found so fascinating was how you did say a, a lot of these things. They're not, it has nothing to do with morals. Like it is not, care tasks are neutral, contributing to a household are neutral, outsourcing care, your weight, your food, these are all morally neutral. Can you talk more about that? It's fascinating. Yeah, I think that most people, and maybe I have a confirmation bias because I was a therapist and sort of like a high school fuck up, but um, most people that I know personally and professionally um, are really plagued and or driven by a deep seated terror that they suspect they are not worthy of love and they are worried somebody will realize that. And so when you feel that way, it's really easy to over moralize everything in your life because you're constantly looking for that answer. You're constantly looking for evidence of that fear um, and constantly looking for validation that maybe that fear is not true. And I think one of the blessings that I got from going to rehab so early, there's a lot of things about my rehab that I don't necessarily agree with, but at the end of the day, I spent a year and a half with 16 other girls that eventually we all just broke down and bared our souls to each other and talked about how much we hated each other, uh, hated ourselves and how terrified we were that we weren't worthy and all of the things that we had done that we were ashamed of and all of the things about ourselves that we were deeply ashamed were irrevocably broken. And um, we did that. And then at the end, sort of realized that nobody was running, screaming from the room um, and had this moment of like, oh, we're all broken. And yet we all have this deep vulnerability of wanting to be loved and we could just decide to love each other. And having that experience of community where somebody knows every single part of you and all, everything you think is failing and shameful and having them love you anyways was deeply healing. And so I think that going from that and realizing like I really am worthy of love, it made it easier to see how many things we look to to try and and like build that case whether it's oh i have the perfect diet i have i have a you know a small body i'm very responsible i work really hard i'm such a great lover i'm so like all of these things that we're moving through life not necessarily trying to figure out what is most functional for me and what brings me joy and what gives me a meaningful life but instead constantly on this journey of what could I do to be good enough? And then when I feel like I can't do those things, how do I hide that from everybody and try again harder? I, I, I feel like that's, that's the thing that I really connect to because, and, and, you know, I'm, I'll, I have a passage from the book and we should say it's uh, how to keep house while drowning. <laughs> it's fantastic. There's a passage early in the book where you talk about the, uh, in my work as a therapist, I have seen hundreds of clients who struggle with these issues. And I'm convinced now more than ever that of, of one simple truth, they are not lazy. In fact, I do not think laziness exists. And I say that not so we can dive necessarily into laziness, but all the things that you're talking about, the things that I respond to when I am feeling judged, whether it's laziness or fear or, you know, anxiety, whatever the thing is that is being foist upon me or that I'm taking on from the world that is triggering my rejection sensitivity so, so heavily is, is all self-imposed, right? It's so, so self-imposed. It is, it is that, um, that, uh, interest paid on a debt that never comes due, right? I just, I, I love that so much. And it is likely a projection of someone else who can't figure out all of the same stuff in their own head and body and space, right? I mean, is, am I, am I getting to something there? Because that, that is really how it, it touches me. Yeah. And I want to, I, I want to hold space for that. I mean, I think it's hard to thread this needle in the self-help space of 
there is a great amount of my own joy or distress that is within my control by shifting my mindset, by letting go of you know, these sort of self-imposed judgments of realizing like, oh, I, nobody's looking at me. I just think everyone's looking at me. There's a huge amount of control I have over that. And I also want to hold space for, you know, people in more marginalized communities are not just dealing with a mindset shift. And, and people, and you don't even have to be a marginalized community, but for example, I have a lot of followers that have been in abusive relationships where part of that abuse from their partner was being told they were lazy. Right. And so it, it's an interesting, you know, as I say, thing to needle to thread that, you know, we can't fix all of your very real barriers. And there's a good amount of distress that we could decrease in your life by recognizing what, what part of this have I been unknowingly kind of carrying around that I could just put down right now. That's not and mine. I, and that's that that's yeah. the thing, right? It's it's that and and it's the thing that that you know, I get into this with my wife all the time uh, just around anything. It's like you you know, if if there is something that I might say about my, you know, my son who's a teenager. He's a teenager, right? If it comes off and he's projecting laziness, that's laziness to me, right? It's laziness cuz that's what I'm seeing and I am I am therefore saddling him with my perception of what he should be doing. And I feel like when I hear that from somebody else talking about me or my behavior, it is liberating to stop and say, well, wait a minute, that perspective is not mine to own. Yeah, it's not it's not the objective perspective. And that person, just like I said earlier, most people are moving through life with a deep terror of not being good enough. And so what happens for some people is that there are things that that person is naturally good at, or maybe something that was sort of imposed upon them in an oppressive nature that they, you know, had to deal with for a very long time and put a lot of time and energy to conforming to that. And now what they have is still don't, they've, they've sort of quote unquote succeeded at these things that society has told them make them morally good enough, um, yet still feel deeply insecure. And so now what they're doing is using that by pointing out what you haven't done. Because now if, if they can just feel better than someone else, that can sort of be this cheap substitute for true self-confidence or, or that true worthiness is just, well, at least I'm better than this person. So I need other people to be lazy. I need their failures to be of their own making. So I don't have to deal with the anxiety that the world is, you know, just a spinning ball and nothing really makes sense. Um, and, and I, so I think that's the other side of it is that we're constantly trying to, you know, push other people down because being above them. And I remember that was something I recognized early in rehab was, realizing that I never felt equal to anyone. I only ever felt better than them or less than them. And I was stepping on the people I felt less than and using them for what they could give me. For for example, I had a, a friend that had a car and I didn't have a car and I didn't like her and I wasn't nice to her, but I used her for that car and I thought I was better than her. And then I had friends or lovers that I thought were better than me and their, their liking of me and acceptance of me was pulling me up and making me feel good enough because they deigned to love me. Um, and recognizing that I, I always felt like I was on the top of the heap or the bottom of the heap was one of the first aha moments of this is this like one thing is really running my life and causing harm to a lot of people and causing harm to me. And it becomes a discussion of like the perils of, fill in the blank relativism, right? Whether it's emotional relativism or relationship or productivity relativism, like just, it, you know, I think about your book, it's like, just because my house is dirty, and my neighbor's house is clean does not make me worse than them, right? By relationship. I, I love it. Well, and it's interesting, too, when you talk about trauma, because I don't think I have ever read a book about cleaning or even, you know, anything about cleaning chores organization that even touches trauma. And so it was really interesting. And I am so glad that your voice is, is out there because I never personally related that cleaning a toilet could trigger someone. 
it never dawned on me until I read it in your book. And I thought, wow, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And so what, what, um, I'm just curious, like what, what were your thoughts in bringing that into this book? Well, it's interesting because I agree with you that most of us don't think about trauma and cleaning in the same space. But what I found as I was making videos online and I was talking about sort of this gentle way of approaching home care and all of these mindset shifts and all these sort of hacks for your neurodivergent brain to be able to get things done, I started hearing story after story from people that follow me um, about how cleaning is hard for them because of the experience that they had with cleaning as a child. And their experiences ran the gamut of the whole thing, right? You had people that said, I grew up and I was abused and neglected and everything was so dirty and I wasn't cared for. And so now I have so much anxiety around mess. I can't let anything be messy. And I feel like if, if the playroom is messy for five minutes, then I'm abusing my child. And then you have people from that same environment say, I'm, I'm now the messiest person ever because there was no one at that time to teach me how to care for myself. And even though I recognized that that wasn't safe for me, I still loved my mom. And so now I sort of feel more familiar in this dysfunction, even though I know it's not good for me. And then you have people that would say, you know, I, my mom would never play with me because she always had to keep the house perfect. You had people say, my parents would scream at me to pick up my room and I didn't know how. And they would come in and th and put all my things in a trash bag and throw it away. I had my dad wake me up at 3 a.m. and start throwing things off my shelves because he told me to clean and he came home at 3 a.m. and decided it wasn't good enough. And I mean, I, these are not a small amount of stories. And I don't think even the people who were talking ab about these stories had connected because that's, it's not like that was the only abusive thing their parent was doing. That was like a little blip in the big abusive radar. Um, but our society treats cleaning and dishes and stuff like it's this very easy throwaway character measure. Like everyone can do it. It takes two seconds. It's a choice. And you make a choice to be clean. Exactly. So I don't think that we, many people give enough legitimacy to like, oh no, I have like a pretty screwed up emotional relationship to these tasks yeah. due to early adverse childhood experiences. There's this phrase that I love that says neurons that fire together, wire together. And so if you have an experience in a certain emotional context over and over and over your brain begins to sort of pair those two things together. And sort of an interesting example of this is that for a very, very long time, I really disliked the sound of birds. And the reason was because in the worst part of my addiction, I would come home from school, get high, wait for my parents to fall asleep. And then I would sneak out in the middle of the night and go get high all night. And then I would come home, sneak back in the house and just lay there, either passed out or not be able to, to sleep. And when morning came, the first thing I would hear is the birds chirping. And there was this sense of, I just spent hours in this like dark place, both physically and mentally. And then that weird feeling of like, the morning birds, like that new life, new hope. It was almost kind of a slap in the face, mm -hmm. if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this mm -hmm. reminder that like, oh, the, the rest of the world is now waking up to be productive, happy people. And I'm just this like bridge troll that can't function, that comes out at night. You know what I mean? And, and so that feeling of depression that I would feel in the mornings, um, when I heard those birds actually got linked in my brain. And so for, for many years after that, when I would hear those, that those morning bird chirps, I would just, I just got this uncomfy, gross feeling. Um, and I don't feel that anymore because it's now been, you know, 18 years since, since that, but your brain will do that with things. And so, you know, if every time you tried to clean something, you were yelled at for it not being good enough, that may have not been quote unquote traumatic, 
But if it happened enough times, especially as a child, your brain pairs that feeling of disapproval with that act of cleaning. And if you're already somebody that struggles with the reward center of your brain and not getting enough dopamine, you're not going to want to go near those sort of tasks with a 10 foot bowl. So let's talk, you, you said your ADHD diagnosis came relatively recently. When was that? Last year. Last year. So I'm, how do you reflect on the things that you were able to reassess given the the gift of hindsight and a new awareness of ADHD? How did those things connect? I did experience some grief when I got the diagnosis. Um, there were some things about my life that were really hard, but in general, I have such a wonderful life now that I don't have this grief of like, you know, oh, things could have been so different. Cause like, I truly like I'm sober and I'm happy and I have a lovely family and a lovely career and all these things. Um, and I actually, you know, I did a, so much work, therapeutic work to get to a place where I accept myself and, and like myself. I think where the grief came in was like, man, I had to work so hard for that. And it shouldn't have had to have been that hard. Like I got there eventually. I got here, right? But mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's sad that I had to work so hard to be okay with myself. Um, and you know, looking back, it made me, you know, I'm grateful that I developed the skills to not interrupt people because I know that there are many people that feel as though they're not being valued by me when I do that. And but I look back and think, you know, we could have met those goals without making me feel like ev my personality made me a piece of shit. Yeah. Like we really yeah. could have still yeah. done that. Like we could have gotten sober. We could have talked about how, and I was a very selfish person, but we could have talked about how I was being selfish without demonizing whole personality traits. Like it could have both been true, like, hey, you're not a bad person because you interrupt people. And when you interrupt people, this is the impact it has on them. So you need to reflect on whether that's the kind of relationship you want to have, whether that's the kind of impact you want to have on people. And if you would like to not have that kind of impact on people, if you want to be more loving in your relationships because you don't, you want people to feel valued and heard, here are some skills that we could implement to sort of stop that impulsive, you know, thing. And, you know, like you could still do that. You could still teach someone the impact of interrupting and, and how to not interrupt without basically making them feel like interrupting people makes them a selfish piece of shit. And so they just shut it down and lock it down forever. So I'm curious about your timeline. So your book it came out in 2020. Yeah. So I self-published the book in 2020. And then um, I just released a expanded version um, through a publishing house. So I worked with Simon and Schuster to do like this updated expanded version. Cause the first version was like maybe 50 pages. Um, and since then, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work sort of bringing those principles to life and getting some more clarity around those principles and a lot more practical tips. And so the interesting thing was when I started my TikTok channel, I was not diagnosed. And, but I, okay. I quickly started to attract all of the little ADHD community to my page going, mm -hmm. oh, this is the first thing that's ever helped me. <laughs> these, these tricks right. work so well for my brain. Um, and people would ask me like, do you have ADHD? And I'd say, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, you know, these things just work for my brain also. And I remember making one that's saying like, Hey, I don't have ADHD. I just follow a lot of ADHD people. I just have a lot of tips that help people with ADHD. I just relate a lot to a lot of AD. I maybe need to make a phone call. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I didn't think I was worried to like self validate that maybe I had ADHD because um, although I did fail out of high school, I also had an addiction. And previous to that addiction, I did very well in school. Um, I've had a great career. And so I thought people who know me are going to think that I'm just being a fraud for the internet if I start saying that I think I have ADHD because I've been so successful. 
Um, I didn't think. Oh, because you tied the success. Exactly. Not, like, oh, I, we've talked about this before. I can't, I can't be successful if I have ADHD. Yeah. yeah. I, I Interesting. got good yeah. grades. I was, I'm very intelligent. I liked school. i never felt distracted during school. Um, mm-hmm. But I also never did my homework. And so I literally had people that follow me just begin to comment over and over like, KC, you know, I'm not trying to be inappropriate here. I'm not trying to like diagnose someone on the internet, but like, you really seem ADHD. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you should really get an assessment. And so I actually, luckily, was already transferring psychiatrists away from a postpartum uh, unit because I had postpartum depression onto a psychiatrist. And she, when she first met with me, she's like, I see in the notes that you have concerns you may, maybe have ADHD. Why is that? And I was like, well, the thing is, is that it's really hard for me to keep up in my home unless I have these like elaborate systems. Like everything has to be systematized that just like feels good to my brain. Otherwise I can't do it. And when I create the system, the system has to be visual. And I showed her like this whole um, planner that I had created myself for like, these are the five things I do every night. This is the one thing a week I do. This is my star chart in order to keep track of it. I do this a little list of five things every night. And I talked to her about how um, I didn't seem to have very good memory. I said, I, like, I only remember things if I'm being visually stimulated to remember them. Like if my kid spills mm-hmm. an applesauce on the floor, I can think to myself like, oh, I need to clean that. But then if I turn around and see that, you know, the cats haven't been fed, I go, oh yeah, I got to feed the cats. And then I forget about the applesauce on the floor until the next time I see the applesauce on the floor and I go, oh, I got to clean that applesauce off the floor. And when I had two children that at the time were like six months and 18 or yeah, six months and two, or I don't know, that all of a sudden became like untenable because like, there's so, there's so much going on that I'm constantly just ping ponging back and forth and can't actually get everything done. And I showed her how messy my room was. I I said, even though I do the same five things every night, I can't remember them. I have to look back at the list every single night, multiple times. And she said, okay, well, this honestly sounds exactly like a presentation of adult female ADHD. And then said, let me ask you some questions about your childhood. And she asked me if I had any of the learning disorders. And I said, yes, I have dyslexia, dyscalculia, and auditory processing disorder diagnosed in the third grade. She said, well, there's a pretty high percentage of people that like who are diagnosed with those who are also ADHD. Um, You know, did you have any addictions? And I was like, well, yeah, I had a lot of addictions. She was like, well, there's a pretty high percentage of people that get cross diagnosed with addictions and ADHD. Did you ever have any um, vocal tics or like OCD behavior? And I was like, yeah, actually, I developed a vocal tic when my parents were getting divorced. And I had this weird thing about light switches for a while. They only only come out when I'm really stressed. And she was like, hmm. Because there's a really high percentage of people with vocal tics, but, and it was just like, this is so bizarre. And then she finally explained to me that, you know, ADHD is not about the inability to pay attention. It's about the inability to regulate your attention. And that the reason that me and so many other girls get sort of fly under the radar is she said, uh, you were interested in school. Yep. Mm -hmm. You were mm-hmm. interested. So you didn't have to study. You didn't have to do homework. You didn't have to do any of these things because you were interested in the lecture and you could retain everything that you heard because it made sense in a systematized way in your mind. And when you got to a place where you know you were removed from that structure, you could not create it. You know, I, I said I would, I would, I would kept thinking I'll remember this homework and then I would forget it or I would write it down and then close the journal and then forget that I had ever written it down. Like I just had no way of creating my own structure to do homework. And when I got into high school, they changed the way that grades were weighted. Like it it used Mm. to be that your class participation and your, and your um, tests were like the main percentage of your grade. So even though I never did any homework and I mean, straight zeros, um, I was really fast. And so I was finishing a lot of my homework in class because I would get done with assignments before everybody else. And then anything left over, I was getting straight zeros on, but I was still getting A's because of the way everything was weighted. And Mm -hmm. then I went to, because I was getting hundreds on tests. Then I go into 
Um, the other thing is that they would say, okay, I'm going to teach you chapters one and two. Then I'm going to give you a worksheet on one and two, then homework on one and two. And then I'm going to test you on chapters one and two. So I, I'm listening to the lecture on one and two and I've got it. I don't need to do any of this other work. I'm going to ace the test. You move into high school and they start doing this thing where they go, I'm going to teach you chapters one and two. You're going to go home and read chapters three and four. And then right. I'm going to I'm going to test you on chapters one through four. And all of a sudden, oh, just paying attention yeah. in class wasn't cutting it. And I had Enough. no skills yeah. to figure out how to study or do work outside of school. But what's so interesting about that is just to be fair, the structures that they were teaching you were not built for the structures that you then had to create for yourself. So, right, right. There's there's like, again, in terms of taking responsibility and ownership for, you know, our own shortcomings. Part of it is because we don't understand universal design for education yet, and we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, right. So looking back at that and going, gosh, I wish somebody would have noticed Yeah. and and just yeah. realized that what I needed was for someone to sit down with me yeah. and, and look at that. And I needed for my, my teachers to communicate directly with my parents what the homework assignments were. Um, yeah, it just makes me sad the amount of things that I could have done yeah. had I had mm -hmm. more accommodations. So I'm curious about, you know, here we are today. So what is the message that you want to communicate to your followers? What, what are you hoping that they get from you? What I hope that they get is I hope that people who, what I affectionately refer to as the self-help rejects, where mm -hmm. you've tried to get your life together, you've tried all of the different books and programs and worksheets and planners, you've tried all of these systems on how to sort of get it together because you kind of feel like a mess all the time and it's not working. And my message is that one of the reasons that that's not working is because we're approaching that from this sort of journey of worthiness where we feel like we're unworthy. And if we can get it together, then we'll finally be worthy and happy. And yeah. we're never going to find that where you're looking for it. You know, we're, we're looking for how to be better at anything from manifesting to budgeting, to doing laundry, to meal prepping, to the kind of diet, the kind of exercise, the kind of relationship. But when we approach all of that from this perspective of, I need to do these things to get better, to be a more acceptable human so that I can be more worthy and then I'll be happier. It doesn't work that way. Those things are not designed to make you more worthy. They are designed to make your quality of life better. So we have to start from a foundation of worthiness. We have to start from neutralizing all of these things. These things are all morally neutral. You're not a better person if you can meal prep. They're just functional things. And the only reason to engage in them is because they make your life better. So if you're in a season of life where exercising isn't making your life better, don't do it. Right. Or if you're in a season of life where exercising would make your life better, but so would therapy, and you only have the time and energy for one or the other, prioritize whichever one is more important to you, not what society is telling you your life needs to look like. If we start with a foundation of worthiness, and my suggestion is that the best way to do that is through self-compassion. I'm not a big fan of self-esteem, but through self-compassion, we learn how to change the way we talk to ourselves about our house and our, our home care and our body care. Um, and then neutralize as morally neutral, all of these things. Then we can begin to go, I am a person that deserves to function. I can sort of start being creative and think outside the box about I'm a person that deserves clean clothes. And since doing laundry is morally neutral, the only reason to do laundry is to have clean clothes. And if I'm not able to do laundry because some part of this is getting me stuck, then I get to retrofit laundry any way that works for me, whether that means I don't fold anything anymore, I send everything out to get washed and delivered in 24 hours, I mix my colors and my whites, I get rid of everything except for seven days worth of clothing, um, I you know, you name it. I, I have a family closet where everybody's clothes go in the same closet. 
any way that gets you to the functional piece of clean laundry, this is where we get into how do I hack my ADHD? How do I find adaptive routines and embrace this sort of adaptive imperfection? Start imperfection, looking mm-hmm. at these things as accommodations that I'm giving to myself and my home. Um, because what I notice is I don't have to do a lot of prescriptive, here's how to do the laundry. Because if you set someone free from that journey of worthiness and realize that they're on a journey of care, all of a sudden their natural creativity comes out when they stop hating themselves for not being able to do the dishes. As soon as they realize that the person that they're feared of, uh, uh, they're afraid is judging them, isn't in the room with them, watching them pull laundry out of the laundry basket. Nobody's yep. watching. Nobody's opinion is going to change of you because that's the way you do your laundry. Well, and it is an accommodation. It's interesting. I remember watching a, a conference, um, a session conference at the Chad International Conference. I don't know what I'm trying to say. But anyway, it was a, a session. And one of the gals that was talking was saying that like having a house cleaner, having somebody that comes in and cleans your house is an accommodation. It's not a luxury. And we so tie it into this luxury thing to have, but it's, it's not, it's an accommodation, just like what you're talking about with, with the hamper service, right? Being able to do that. And I think, I don't know if it was in your book, but I, I have said this before as well. And I think I did see it. If have paper plates sometimes like, right. Like if, you know, if you don't want to do your dishes, that's a, that's a hack, like get the paper plates. Don't worry about it. Who cares? Like, and it doesn't have to be black and white. Like I, I for so long was like, okay, you know, you're either someone that never uses paper plates or you're someone that only uses paper plates. And recently what I did was I sort of like faked a dish downsize where I moved all my dishes like up to a different place. And I picked out like the amount of dishes that wasn't overwhelming for me to wash every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because like, generally speaking, my kids will use six plates. I'll use two plates in a bowl. I have two cups for them two cups for me and my husband, and then they have their water cups and I have one coffee cup and I put them in this one thing. And I just said, this is it. If I saw all of these dishes in the sink, I could still do them. And what I do Mm. is that obviously like not every day is the same, but if I ever Mm -hmm. use all those and need more, that's when I dip into my compostable plates. Mm. Right. Right? It's not all or nothing. Right. Some days I never use them. Other days, for whatever reason, I ate more meals at home or we we did more. So so it's this overflow that I go, no matter what, I won't be overwhelmed because I only use a certain number of my washable dishes. Um, but if I need something more than that, or if I go, frankly, this morning, I just didn't, I was so tired. I didn't know what was going on. So I went, this is the meal I'm going to use a compostable plate for. Sure. But you can, sure. you can mix and match. Yeah, absolutely. And I can even see myself saying, okay, I want to keep the kitchen just a little bit clean, cleaner, a little bit longer. So I'm going to go ahead and do the paper <laughs> plates right now, just so that I don't have to see the mess, you know, like just a little bit longer. So I love that. It doesn't have to be. And you know, my other like sort of ADHD again. awakening was um, so many people, it makes me so sad, would comment and say, like, I went to my psychiatrist and, and brought up the ADHD and they said, OK, I probably did have it. But since I'm not in school, I don't need medication. Um, and the amount of people that you know, or the amount of times I've been told like, Hey, it's really good to, so my psychiatrist at first said like, it's good to take a break, you know, to try to not take it on the weekends or try to take one day a week. But what happened for me was I went back to the next week and I said, well, here's the problem. Um, I'm on an SSRI and antidepressant, but my, the biggest breakthrough in my postpartum depression was when I started taking Vyvanse. I said, Mm -hmm. it is a life raft. And it is so capitalistic and patriarchal that we tell people you're allowed to have medication to go to work, right? but but you should take a break on the weekends. And it's like, has, has nobody spoken to a freaking mother about this? Because I, I need that medication on Saturday and Sunday, almost honestly, almost more than I need it during the week. You bet. Yeah, I agree. When I'm taking my kids are two and four and Vyvanse stabilizes my, what I realized why I was snapping and getting irritable all the time. And I thought that was like a depression thing. And and it might've been, but what was happening was 
I, for a lengthy amount of reasons, the ADHD, the postpartum depression, the trauma from the pandemic, when I experience this sort of dopamine lag of like, I'm tired and I'm not motivated and I can't engage my task initiation and physically I feel like I have no energy in my body. Well, you pair that with little kids that are going to ask you for something every seven minutes that's going to require you getting up and you're either going to do it because you feel guilty because you don't want to be a shitty mom or you're going to say no and then feel guilty. And then you're so eventually you just start getting irritated at them for asking. Yep. And you know that they behave better if you get them out, but you can't get your shit together enough on a task basis to, to get them out the door because that requires so many steps. And I said to her, here's the thing. I cannot afford to feel that way when taking care of my kids. I need to take care of my kids. I get them snacks. I need to do the laundry. I need to clean up the house. I need to do all of these things on Saturdays and Sundays. And God bless her. She said, okay, I think in this case, you should not stop taking them. You need to take them continuously. Right. Like, like parents deserve to function on the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. You well, bet. And, and that has you been bet. so largely debunked. The idea of right. needing mm-hmm. a break like that is we had uh, it was yeah. uh, Bill Dodson on the show talking about, you know, it, there he is writing a textbook about how to teach practitioners and prescribers how to prescribe medication and said, point blank, stop it. Stop it. Stop saying Mm -hmm. that to people. Don't you want to feel Mm -hmm. as productive and good on the weekend as you do when you are at, at quote, work? Don't you want to be as productive Mm -hmm. as a student doing your homework on the weekend as you do when you're in class at school? There is no there is no medical reason. There's no physiological reason to stop. So it's it debunked debunked. And it just goes along with that sort of myth of ADHD that it only affects work and school yes yeah right that like executive functioning isn't required to like live (laughs) the rest of your life and that it's an and i think that idea that it's an attention problem so i I, the struggle must be that you can't pay attention at work or pay attention in school but why would you need to pay attention that much on saturdays and sundays instead of really looking at it as the to me the executive functioning problems are the most disabling yeah Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. that, I mean, I almost, I honestly probably require a higher degree of executive functioning when I'm taking care of my kids than I do when I'm working on my online stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's transition because we're getting, we're, we're yeah. getting along. I want to hear about the influencer part. I want to get back to that okay. question I opened with, <laughs> yeah. how did you end up with 1.4 million followers on TikTok? Okay. Uh, so my sister told me to get on TikTok because she thought I would think it was funny. And I posted a few things here and there, no big deal. Um, And then one day I ended up getting some time. It's like this miraculous, my kids went, took a nap at the same time. And I videoed me cleaning my house and it was a disaster. (laughs) And I have always had this way um, that I have sort of kept myself from being too overwhelmed. And it was something my psychiatrist mentioned to me that one of the reasons why I escaped being diagnosed for so long was because I was engaging in compensatory behavior at such a high level. I was like surpassing even neurotypical people's functioning for the most part, but it shouldn't have to be that hard. And she was like, it's not measured by how well you're doing. It's measured by how hard do you have to work to do that well? Um, And so what I've always done when I look at a room and I see a thousand things in it, as I say, okay, there's not a thousand things in this room. There's only five. In any room you have ever been in, there's only five things. There's trash, dishes, laundry, things that have a place that are not in their place and things that do not have a place. And I start with trash and I get a trash bag and I clean up all the trash. And so I made this sort of this video showing, okay, look how it looks like when all the trash is gone. And and then I get all the laundry and now look at it. And I said, if you're somebody who struggles with depression or ADHD, or you just have kids or you feel overwhelmed, see if this helps you. And that video blew up and people started saying, this is the first thing that's ever helped me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I just started sort of riffing off of that and making more content Mm -hmm. like that and answering questions. And because I'm a therapist, the first time someone said, thank you for showing your house, I have so much shame Mm -hmm. over my inability to clean. And the idea to hear somebody say, it's okay, just do it a different way. 
And so I just sort of noticed that those were the videos getting the most hits. So I was like, all right, I'll keep talking about that. And, and sort of talking about that intersection of mental health and therapy and home and self-care. And I think that there's just not a lot out there about home care and lifestyle care in particular that isn't like hyper aspirational and it's so true about being right. aesthetically and I mean, going pleasing. Back to, yeah. And going back to you, even bringing up the, the trauma when it comes to cleaning there, are, this information is not there. It's not available. And that aspirational until stuff, now, yeah, until now that aspirational <laughs> stuff feeds into that existing problem of if I just get my life together, I'll feel better. Because there's yeah. something that happens when you watch someone do a perfect pantry restock or when you watch someone talk about this like perfect rainbow bookcase or their perfect what I eat in a day meal plan. Like you have an emotional experience watching that. It's peaceful or it's calming or there's some sort of like joy that that brings or calm that that brings. And that's fine, but I think what most of us do is we mistake the emotional experience of consuming that media for believing that it's a foregone conclusion that, okay, so then if I just did what this person is doing, then that feeling I had in 30 seconds of watching them, that could be my whole life. That's how right. I would feel all the time. I would just, I would feel this, whatever emotional, like that would be the feeling that I'm having if I were to do that. And that's not actually true. Like you can, you can still enjoy your aesthetic cleaning videos and your organization stuff and your pants, like those videos still, they're like ASMR, right? Like they still yeah. are cool to watch, but you can also just be okay with that emotional experience just being you know, it's as, it's like when you, when you look at a video of a pup and you go, oh, and you feel how cute that is. But to then conclude that if I were to get a dog, I would feel that way all the time. And it would significantly, it, you know, the quality of my life would just go through the roof. Cause I would have that feeling all the time. Would you get that feeling sometimes? Yeah. But in some ways, it would be worse because you'd be picking up poop. You'd be you know, dealing right, with, they're right. chewing up your shit. And so I think sometimes when it comes to social media, yeah. just recognizing, okay, the feeling that I have about how cool and warm and fuzzy this looks does not necessarily translate into like, I would feel that way if I just had a pantry that looked like that. Well, this is why, this is why, I mean, I love home remodel shows, you know, I love them when these external people come into somebody's house and they work with them and they build a plan and then they, the people go away and are, they come back for the reveal. Any of those formula shows, oh, so I'm good. absolutely in. But what I really want to see subversively is I want to come back to that house a month later, because I guarantee you it will be destroyed, a dumpster fire, because real life doesn't look like that. It looks like my house all the time. And yeah. I, I just... You mean you don't have little fresh cupcakes on a tray oh on God. your island in the kitchen? Oh, dare, <laughs> just ready to dare eat to all dream, the But time. that's why I watch home remodel yeah. porn, because it satisfies that, that chemical attraction that I have. And it's the same reason, you know, we watch anything that makes that. I just find that so delightful. I want to make that show, the horror show that is one month later. Like, just let's just see how real people live in this fancy house. I try to think of it also as like eating a good meal. Like, it is true that when my, when, when I get to a, you know, a Sunday afternoon and I clean everything and I organize yeah. everything and I light a candle and I get some, like, it is true that that gives me like a peaceful feeling that that feels good. Like, wow, wow, how serene. Yeah. But it's not possible to hold that feeling all the time and actually live in your house. And so I try to think of it as like, Hey, I also like the feeling like pizza. When I eat pizza, like when you eat a good meal, that feeling of like, Oh, it's amazing. It's incredible. But nobody expects you to have that feeling with every meal you eat. No right. one, no one thinks that, well, so then if I just never stop eating pizza, if I just eat pizza every second of the day, I could have that feeling all the time, right? Like we kind of know that, like we know, right. yeah, it's okay to think that that's peaceful. It's also okay to not 
like exhaust yourself and berate yourself at not being able to hold that space in that perfection all the time, as if it's an obligation Mm -hmm. or as if it's even reasonable to be able to do so. Yeah. Right. Well, th- and so that totally sidetracked us from this discussion of how you ended up. <laughs> doing oh yeah, this. sorry. I'm, you did I'm the such first a video, and then I did the first video, and then now it blew there's up. this. In, in in one week, I went from six thousand followers to twenty thousand, and someone commented and said, "You know, I'm just so grateful to find my people. I didn't think anybody else was like me." And I remember responding and saying, "Listen, I had six thousand followers, posted that video, and now I have twenty thousand. So you're you're not only not alone." I think you're in really good company. And I said, off the mm-hmm. hip, welcome to Struggle Care. Yeah. And that's where oh, the, the sort of cool. brand name come yeah. from, came from. My website is called Struggle Care. My hashtag is Struggle Care. Um, it's this idea that, you know, I don't know really how to make you not struggle, but I can teach you how to care for yourself in the midst of that struggle. And we will work together on you being able to believe that you're worthy of that care, even if you're struggling, like you're worthy of kindness, regardless of your level of functioning, even if the kindness is only coming from you. And and from there, it just kind of took off. I mean, it just continued to build. Um, I had a a big, I got up to about 5,000, 500,000 followers. And then I had a video, I've had several videos go viral, but I had a video go mega viral, like 11, 11 million views. Um, And it was a video where I said, you are not lazy. There are hundreds of reasons why people struggle to do care tasks. And I think the combination of, because now there are other influencers out there doing, you know, like kind of the unfiltered cleaning and things like that. But I think that I just got lucky that TikTok is a, um, a platform that really works well for my brain. And Mm -hmm. I also think that having um, as a therapist, being able to take this idea and actually break it down into like, okay, there are really six pillars that make up this foundational shift and being able to actually pave a way for emotional change, as opposed to just giving practical tips about laundry or dishes, being able to do both of those things, I think has created a space um, that is unlike other spaces. And so it's just been attracting people. And, and then I had a, you know, a literary agent reach out to me and then they hooked me up with a bunch of publishing houses. Um, I've started pre-recording a podcast season and I mean, it's just, it truly is just this bizarre trip of just like, the the growth, just the followers just keep coming and I just keep making the same kind of content. How does this, uh, how does it impact your actual practice as a therapist? Are you still seeing people? No, I actually stopped seeing people. I stopped really working when I became a stay at home mom. And then, um, you know, the pandemic happened and I was at home with both of my kids. And it, I feel like this platform has been a personal lifeline for me because all of the sort of hacks that I've made in my home have all been since I started this channel with the exception of that five things thing that I've been doing my whole life. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that like this you're they're taking this journey along with me um, sure. as I'm sort mm-hmm. of solidifying some of these things and I, and identifying them and changing the things around my home. Um, and it's been a lifeline to me to experience feeling like there's, it's, it's really meaningful work for me. You you dropped uh, viral and mega viral. Uh, what's your what does that do to you when you when something goes viral? We've we've heard from others that it's uh, it's not always what it's cracked up to be. I'm pretty good at knowing what kind of criticism a video is going to bring, um, and there are certain criticisms that I don't care. Like I. I know someone's going to call me lazy. I know someone's going to call me a bad mom. I'm prepared for that. And in fact, I welcome that because I like to respond to those in videos because number one, not necessarily to defend myself because I don't need to defend myself against strangers on the internet, but I like to show people an example of number one, me not feeling ashamed so that they could feel like they don't have to be ashamed. I like to give people, um, an example of how to speak to their inner critic. Mm-hmm. Because the truth mm-hmm. is, is that mm-hmm. we call ourselves all of those things. Yeah. But it, it's, it's not like the outer critic is like early to the party. Right. right. Um, so right. that doesn't bother me at all. Um, I mean, 
I say it doesn't bother. It's just, it sucks. Like it stings to have people say that, but I, I, I know that they just don't understand and they don't get it. And I'm totally confident in who I am. Um, I, the only ones that really bother me are, um, I have made some videos where I talk about like gender issues, especially like division of care, um, where I've talked about the effect of patriarchy on women. Um, and whenever those videos go viral and get, I can always tell when they get outside of my normal demographic because I start getting extremely hateful, misogynistic comments. Um, oh, and yeah. so typically on those types of videos, I eventually will turn comments off. Mm -hmm. Like there comes a point mm -hmm. at which, um, you know, whatever the number, like, you know, videos will grow faster when comments are on, but there comes a point at which like, I've already meaningfully engaged with the criticism or the hate in a way that's helpful to my audience. And so I'm not just going to like sit around and be bombarded with abusive language day after day. So I usually t will turn the comments off on those kind of videos yeah. eventually. But for the most part, it's pretty predictable what people are going to be mean about. And so that doesn't bother mm -hmm. me as much anymore. You're predominantly on TikTok. In terms of of favorite platforms, it seems like that's the one that because it works for your brain, as you say, but do you have interest elsewhere? Yeah, because I can turn yeah. a camera on and just start talking. So you don't have to versus like sitting down and having to write captions and things. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, so what you're, what we're seeing is just off of the cuff a lot of times, just turning it on and saying, Hey, I'm going to do this or whatever. And almost always, yeah, which is right. why it's funny. Like when I get brand deals yeah. and they're like, Hey, can you do a TikTok this month? And I'll be like, okay. Like the idea of having <laughs> yeah. to like think of an idea because I just wake up, I go to bed Around every night it. thinking I have no more ideas. This is the end of the road for yeah. me. And then wake up and be like, Oh, I have an idea. Uh, well, it's lovely. And uh, we're so, yeah, so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and experience. It's uh, great. And the chat room has been, uh, has been very, very active over the last hour that you have been with us. So um, uh, remember, if you were listening to this on the main feed, if you were a patron, you'd get a special version of this where Casey actually answers these questions that are uh, coming to us. So uh, head over to patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more about that. Uh, Casey, where, so tell people officially where they need to go subscribe right now. So, um, on TikTok, I'm at domestic blisters. Awesome. You can go to my website, um, strugglecare.com and you can really get to anything I do from the website. You can get the book, an audio book. I have online courses on how to clean your depression house, ADHD friendly. I have workbooks on, on, you know, how to declutter, how to help your kids with care tasks. Um, and then the information for any events that I'm attending. So the whole thing is just right there, plus all the links to my socials. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of uh, Casey Davis and uh, Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. We appreciate your time and attention, everyone who is downloading and listening to this show. Uh, jump over to the Discord channel in the Show Talk uh, Show Talk channel in our Discord server. That's where we're going to be hanging out, talking about this show. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you next week right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm -hmm.